Hey, have you ever been vibing out in your room, listening to some of your favorite songs, admiring the subwoofer of your speaker as it delivers magnificence to your eardrums? We all have. But have you ever asked yourself why that same speaker, along with other speakers across the globe, is almost always black? Some of you are probably screaming at your screen right now about your speaker being green, red, or any other color found in the rainbow. Number one, I said, almost always. And number two, if you look closely at the gorgeous design of your brightly colored music player, you'll often find that the speaker beneath it is still colored black. One possible explanation for this is that the original technology of speakers had a diaphragm with black particles on it. So as soon as a sound is amplified, it sends a charge through the diaphragm and these black particles are driven upwards. The carbon particles bouncing and touching the upper membrane of the diaphragm are responsible for creating some of the distinct sounds from our speakers that we all love so much. Speaker manufacturers must have gotten tired of their products changing color with prolonged use, combined with these black particles settling on the upper membrane of the diaphragm. So their logical solution was to color most speakers black. Another more practical belief as to why speakers are mostly colored black is that it's a hue that easily matches up with many types of decor. Walls, furniture, and clothes all often look quite well when combined with this color, which is why it's so prevalent everywhere you go. Listening to music has repeatedly scored in the top 10 pastimes in the US based on research. Nowadays, you find sound speakers everywhere. In your television, laptop, and your phone, you can't escape them. But let's take a look at how they started off. Their origins are in radio and telephone technology. The first form of a speaker was developed by Johann Philipp Rice in 1861. The German was a self-taught inventor and installed the speaker on his telephone. It was just about able to reproduce clear tones, but it could also replicate muffled speech after a few revisions. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, decided to try and produce an improved version of Rice's speaker. Essentially, Bell and other inventors wanted to make an electrodynamic speaker. By 1877, it was still yet to exist, but due to the desire of inventors worldwide to change this, research confirmed that it was extremely possible to make one. In particular, the work of Werner von Siemens, who came up with the idea of an electromagnetic coil-driven speaker, was a driving force in arriving at this conclusion. Why are there magnets in speakers, you might ask? Every speaker nowadays has an electric current, something the inventors were discussing would never have taken for granted at any point in their lives. When this electric current is changing, it produces a magnetic field. To make the panel of the speaker move, magnets are used to create an opposing magnetic field which creates vibrations. These vibrations are the sound we end up hearing. The bigger the magnet, the louder the speaker will be. Another inventor by the name of Thomas Edison from the US had filed a British patent for a system using compressed air for an amplifying mechanism. The first commercial electric loudspeaker saw the light of day only in 1924. The sound quality produced by the speaker was good enough for motion pictures. It took nearly 20 years for the next groundbreaking development in the world of loudspeakers. This came with the arrival of the duplex driver in 1943. It offered better clarity and coherence at high volumes, which was important in movie theaters. Fittingly, it was nicknamed the voice of the theater. The duplex driver was immediately tested by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and instantly made its film house industry standard in 1955. Until now, this loudspeaker design is still used. Indeed, the film industry does seem to put a lot of effort into its sound, and so do the theaters we watch them in. You may have noticed that these buildings often have thick curtains on the walls. These are soundproof or acoustic curtains, and both are much thicker than regular curtains. They will either consist of heavier fabrics that are tightly woven or have better quality linings. This means that these curtains will absorb sound and reduce the acoustic reflection off the ceiling, windows, and flat walls of the room. This ultimately creates a much better sonic experience. The carpet floors are so thick in theaters for the same reason. It helps to trap sound by providing insulation. 
From a practical standpoint, this carpet is also set up to prevent the sound of footsteps during film screenings. This concept of trapping sound is also the reason why putting a phone inside a cup will make the phone's speaker seem louder. Any speaker sitting or suspended in an open space projects its sound in all directions. As the speaker vibrates to create sound waves, an equal amount of energy leaves from both the front and the back. By placing a speaker in some form of enclosure, we can redirect some of the energy that comes from the back of the speaker and project it forwards. By putting the speaker in a cup, you're directing the sound more efficiently. It travels only one way, making it seem louder than what you'd hear when you take it out of the cup. Speaking of phones and speakers, ever wonder why your mobile device makes your speaker produce a buzzing noise? This can occur when the two gadgets are near one another and your mobile is trying to send and receive data. The transfer of information produces electromagnetic disturbances in the medium around the speakers. It creates noise in the audio, and as a result, you can hear the buzzing sound coming from the speaker. A simple way to protect the amazing vibe your speaker is creating for you from this irritating buzzing noise is just to move your phone away from your speaker, or vice versa. This will eliminate what is officially known as electromagnetic interference. Research across America shows that, on average, 74% of people own two or more pairs of headphones. 46% of them mention they listen to their headphones for more than two hours per day. Some choose the headphones by their looks, others by the sound quality. In either case, finding the right pair is important, since a lot of people are willing to spend over $100 on it. Headphones have become a true fashion accessory. That's why well-known figures are trying to make an impact in the headphone industry like it's the fashion industry. Music moguls Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine came up with the idea for the now world-famous Beats by Dre Headphones brand. They were walking along the Pacific Ocean one day in 2006, discussing a sneaker deal as they had an offer on the table from a major brand in that arena. After some discussions, they decided they wanted to do something they were more passionate about and landed on headphones. The duo's idea turned into a brand that was purchased by Apple in 2014 for $3 billion. It was the largest deal in Apple's history, and Beats by Dre controlled 70% of the headphone market at the time of signing. The move allowed Apple to take over the headphone space. The release of their popular wireless AirPods headphones in 2016 was another reason it happened. But how do these popular wireless headphones that many of us own actually work? These headphones rely on internal batteries to have enough power to remain wireless. Most often, they have conveniently built-in rechargeable batteries. But sometimes, they keep going thanks to standard AA or AAA batteries. They receive wirelessly transmitted signals from their paired audio sources, be it your phone or laptop. These signals are encoded by the source device and transmitted most commonly via radio frequencies or infrared carriers. The headphones receive the signal and decode it to audio. And just like that, it's music to your ears.